Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Resolution Foundation uh, event. My name is Torsten Bell. I'm the Chief Executive of the Foundation. Now, this event is part of our rather overly large Economy 2030 inquiry that's a joint project between ourselves, LSE, and the Nuffield Foundation running over the next two years. And it's examining the effect of big drivers of economic change during the 2020s on our economy. And the, the big three obvious ones, Brexit, covid and net zero. And it's net zero we're going to be focusing on this morning. And we're going to be focusing not on lots of what you hear about in the net zero space, about how even more ambitious the target should be, or how the targets aren't ambitious enough and they need to be ramped up, or about what exactly the right technology is. We're going to be focused on delivery of policy to make those targets actually happen, and actually the normalisation of that policy into what government does, thinking about uh, what the distribution on, of that policy is on different kinds of households and what it actually takes to make this decarbonisation actually happen. And this discussion is going to be drawing on uh, a discussion paper we published this morning, written by Jonathan Marshall from uh, ourselves and Anna Valero from the LSE. And then to help us, um, and you're going to hear a summary of that discussion paper in a second from uh, Johnny, who's going to present you some slides running through the headlines of that paper. And then to discuss the discussion paper, uh, you're going to hear from Rebecca Heaton, who has just started as the Director of Sustainability at Ovo Energy and is a former member of the CCC and lots of other jobs in this kind of uh, space. And then you're going to hear from Adair Turner, who my briefing says is a, uh, now what is it, Adair? You're, it's very general, economist and business leader, uh, which I thought was uh, suitably enigmatic, aiming to be the number, new 007. Uh, but anyway, he's actually done everything there, including being the first chair of the CCC. And right now he's also chairing the Energy Transitions Commission, which is kind of a attempt to be a global CCC, to be uh, slightly overly grand about it, maybe. Sort of, yeah. sort of, yes. Anyway, you can tell us what it is in a second today, so don't worry. So that is the plan. As always, you can ask questions on Slido. The hashtag is net zero, and we'll have a few polls there. And people in the room can also log on to Slido. Some of you are online, some of you in the room, but everyone has equal access to Slido because we're a very equal kind of uh, place. So that is the plan. Johnny, over to you to kick us off with the presentation. Cool, thank you. So, very good. So, the UK is entering a new phase on its transition to net zero. That's moving from one where we've been focusing on setting targets to one where we're focusing on delivering policies. The past couple of years, we've seen numerous targets set for emissions. We've seen net zero targets, carbon budgets. We've seen NDCs. We've seen targets for offshore wind, targets for hydrogen, targets for heat pumps. But at the moment, we've got no policies to really achieve any of these. Um, and the 2020s is absolutely vital in increasing the pace of decarbonisation, hitting these goals and getting back on track to where we need to be to reach net zero. Um, and moving into 2020s, the next stage of decarbonisation is going to be very different to that which has come before. Uh, it's going to have a much greater impact on households and on day-to-day -day life. And this slide, this slide um, speaks to that. This, this shows the the pace of decarbonisation in a number of sectors over the previous 15 years and that will be need to be achieved over the next 15 years and it shows there's <clears throat> very slow progress outside of the electricity sector. In particular surface transport and uh, residential property, our homes, are lagging behind. Um, the 2035 targets require acceleration across the board and this will be inherently more impactful on households when we decarbonise how we get around and how we stay warm at home than it has been in decarbonising our electricity system. So our approach, the focus of our discussion paper out this morning, is to attempt to move the debate on from one arguing over targets or arguing over technologies to one in which challenges are faced up to and dealt with. We're going to try and move beyond arguing over whether it's nuclear or wind, whether t targets are too expensive, um, and try and do something more proactive and more constructive. We're going to realise they need to. There's a lot of difficult discussion, difficult decisions that need to be understood, faced up to, and trade-offs need to be made to overcome them. And we're going to attempt to move the debate away, one that's focused on, as Dawson said, on, on jobs, on green jobs, on targets, to one that looks really at households, on the impact of decarbonisation on different households in different parts of society, which we see as absolutely key to making the net zero transition uh, successful. And this is seen as the extent of decarbonisation of the next 15 years, which is going to need some sort of behaviour change. You know, the CCC reports say that from now to 2035, we're going to need uh, the policies to cut emissions are going to need about 60% of those are going to need some sort of behaviour change. 
whereas from 20, 2009 to, to 2019, only about 13% of decarbonisation involved some form of behaviour change. And it's just absolutely essential to know how, how households are going to manage this and can manage this before embarking on this change. And finally, it's the fair distribution and the fair distribution of the cost and the benefits of net zero, which is absolutely key. We need to avoid the costs falling on the shoulders of those that are least able to bear them and avoid the benefits, which are financial and non-financial, such as warmer homes, cleaner air, being concentrated among wealthier families. Um, this, is a, this, this is largely lacking from the climate date, rate so far and is absolutely vital in navigating the next decade and beyond. So this slide shows the CCC's forecast of the net, co net cost of net zero out to 2050. If you add all the numbers up in all the years, the cost above the x-axis and the savings below the x-axis, you see that um, the cost is pretty, pretty manageable. It's about 300 billion pounds but over 30 years. This, is, this isn't beyond the wit of government to sort out. Um, but what this hides are crucial issues around timing. A lot of the investment costs come years or decades before the savings from lower running costs. How are we going to manage this? You know, this is ultimately a function of, of policy. This is something that the government and policymakers need to face up to. And it also hides um, distribution impacts. You know, how are the costs of, say, decarbonising our homes going to be spe um, spread fairly? Uh, the OBR central forecast reckons that about half of the cost of decarbonising our homes is going to be met by property owners. This is homeowners, landlord, landlords, freeholders. But how are we going to make sure this happens in a way that doesn't penalise those who don't have the means to invest in their homes? Sticking with homes, so some recent evidence from how our building stock has improved um, shows how tricky this can be. Um, from 2013 to 2019, there's a general increase in the efficiency of, of England's homes, this is English Housing Survey data, um, but this has, not been, this has not been universal across the income distribution. You know, the start, towards the start of the last decade, if you're in a low, lowest income uh, quintile, you're more likely to live in a, in a more efficient household than if you were at the top of the income spectrum. But towards the end of the decade, this has switched around. And this comes despite the only real long-running support for building decarbonisation, for home decarbonisation, being targeted at fuel poor households and low-income households. So we need to face up, we need to understand why these policies didn't work, were they not funded well enough, were they not accessible enough, um, was there not enough demand, F figure out what the problems were and then tailor those that are going to be in the next stage of our, our journey to net zero so they work in a better way than, than they have done to cut, our, cut emissions from our homes. Um, this is particularly stark when you think about the energy price spike that we're undergoing now. Um, if you live in an A or B rated home, the more efficient home, the, the, inc the impact of the price cap increasing will mean your gas bill will go up about £75 a year. If you're in an E or F rated home, that's going to be about £130 a year on your bill. So if this, if the, if this higher increase is felt by people with lower financial means, then it's obviously going to be, be problematic. Sharing the benefits of net zero is also as important as sharing the costs. So the main, the main payback for investment costs of net zero comes in later years via cheaper motoring. Um, so there's two main prerequisites you need to have as a household to access this. First is having a car. Around half of the lowest income households don't have a car, whereas half of the highest income households have two or more cars. But it's also vital to be able to charge your car at home to get use, access, use electricity when it's cheapest overnight to charge your car when it costs the least. And this is much easier if you can park your car in a garage or on a driveway or off the street. Uh, and again, you can see there's a split across the income distribution of how available this, this sort of parking provision is. If you're in the highest income households, the, the highest fifth um, of the distribution, you're about th you know, more like you're more than more than three quarters of this of this group have access to a garage or off street parking, and this falls to around half for low income homes. And this means that you know without policy intervention, these benefits are going to be concentrated amongst higher high, amongst higher income and richer families um, without policy intervention. So for a successful transition to net zero, we need to place it at the core of our economic model. This is going to require a more hands-on approach. If you look at the intervention that has been made in the electricity system, the government has used almost all of the tools at its disposal. We've had regulations, we've had taxes, we've had subsidies, we've had support for new technologies. This hasn't been the case for other sectors of the economy. And in the next decade and beyond, this is going to have to change. This is, to do this, you're going to have to have net zero as a core tenet of what the government do. It's going to have to require full government buy-in to avoid like we've seen in the past, bickering between different departments, so that's led to progress being slow. Um, net zero will mean that also mean that the the shape of Britain's comparative advantage will change. You know, we have growth industries in offshore wind, in carbon capture, and electric vehicles, but without properly understanding these and planning for these, they could be lost. They could not be not they could be lost or not um, exploited to their full potential. 
And then finally, net zero only increases the urgency that we need to refresh our fiscal policy. Uh, we need to face up to the fact that pollution taxes are dwindling and are carrying dwindling. Fuel duty and vehicle excise duty will continue to fall as we move away from petrol and diesel cars and vans. Um, and our current projection is going to have a, a, a gap to the a, a tax gap by the end of this parliament of around 13 billion pounds per year. This should only increase the pace at which we sort of start to have the discussions about how we're going to fill this gap. Is it road pricing? Is it something else? We need to also need to talk about um, what we're going to do about carbon pricing. Are carbon prices being used effectively across the economy? Do they work well enough to, to drive decarbonisation? And can they be implemented in a way that doesn't make uh, goods and services more expensive for low-income households? So finally, just to go over it again, um, this next decade is going to be a new phase of decarbonisation where the impacts are more visible to households. Successfully navigating these is going to require a thorough understanding of the challenges and the opportunities ahead. The timing of the costs and the benefits and the distributional split of the costs and the benefits are absolutely essential in navigating net zero with a focus on households. And finally, we need to take net zero out of the silo within which climate policy has generally been placed and putting it at the centre of the UK's economic model. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much indeed, Johnny. The, um, and I should apologise to those watching online that we're slightly struggling on the slides visibility, but they will all be available on the um, uh, website along with the report itself. So lots of food for thought there. The, um, some a kind of a, you know a, an attempt to thread a middle line between those that say this whole thing is really really easy and we should just get on with it, and those that say it's so hard we should give up. The, um, but you weren't really ever in the give up bucket no. anyway, Rebecca. So over to you. So um, thank you. I, I would say um, I very much agree on the, the moral and economic case for action, and I think it's never been more obvious than now. Um, with these soaring gas prices, you know, 80% of people's um, of UK homes are heated by gas, and a third of um, an average electricity bill in the UK is linked to fossil fuel prices. So if we can try and decouple that, that has to be a good thing. So I think there's a really economic upside to net zero. And also, though, there's benefits to people's lives. Now, I know that might seem a little bit um, counterintuitive because I completely agree. We've got this really costly and disruptive journey ahead, but ultimately we're going to come out in a much better place. So that's the optimist in me speaking. So um, I've recently joined OVO, and a real reason why I joined OVO was because of their focus on zero carbon living and on taking consumers on that journey and helping consumers to really decarbonise their lives and their homes. So... The sort of solutions we're talking about are, first of all, getting the fabric of our buildings right. So we all know about insulation. We really have to focus on this. But then secondly, electrifying heat, which we all know about. Predominantly, that's probably going to be with heat pumps. But then linking that really closely to electric vehicles. So what can we do with our EV batteries in all these cars? And um, finally, the intelligent tech, which links it all together. So this is sort of this vision for a mini power plant in the home. And over, I've done some trials on this. We ran the world's largest um, EV battery trial. And basically, our members' car batteries were used to supply energy to the grid. So this precious renewable energy that we need to really store and look after when the wind isn't blowing, so we're not using gas, we can actually store that in customers' batteries and feed it back. And the, the average um, income from our customers doing this was £420 a year income that they got, and the, the highest was £800 a year. So we know that this, this can work, which is why the optimist in me is, is feeling more comfortable. But how, how really do we get there equitably? So I think history will really judge us on whether we've taken everybody on this journey. And it's all very well for me with my EV that's not going to work for everybody, so what can we do? So I do worry about EVs. You know, the great thing about them is you can just go in and buy one in, a, in your local garage. That's fantastic. Um, I worry about stranded assets, so these petrol stations. I live in a rural area. There aren't that many petrol stations anyway. We're going to end up with even less. That's going to be the poorest who are going to be really hit by that. But I think um, more of a concern for me really is electrifying our heating in the UK. So and there's two big challenges here. Firstly, the upfront costs. I mean, these things are so eye-wateringly expensive at the moment. So we really do need some government support, but that support should really be aimed at those who are less able to pay. We really have to focus that support. And secondly, 
And this is, I think, an opportunity to really develop the, the heat pump industry in the UK from a cottage industry into something much bigger. It's really well nigh impossible to find a heating engineer. There's 1,200 heat pump engineers in the UK. There's 130,000 gas engineers. And let me tell you, I don't think any of those heat engineers live in mid Wales, because I am really struggling to find someone to put one in. Um, so um, over, we've got a report coming out in a couple of weeks, which really talks about some of the policy levers we think and how this can be really an opportunity in, in job creation for the UK. Other things we could do, so the government have set a ban on gas boilers in new builds, that's great. How about looking at a ban on gas boilers in all houses, or, or new gas boilers in all houses? So if your gas boiler goes kaput, you might have to then move over to a heat pump. So that's the sort of the upfront cost, but the running cost at the moment is going to cost you a lot more to run a heat pump than it is gas, to heat your home with gas. And this is because if you look at an electricity bill, 20% of your electricity bill are these levies, and only 2% of your gas bill is actually these additional levies. So what we need to do is remove those from our bills and generate that income through income tax, which is much fairer and just put a basic carbon tax on gas and electricity. And that would make the running costs of these things much more equitable. And finally, one little thought, stamp duty. We've all seen how that's been really distorting uh, the market at the moment. So how about a zero stamp duty for a zero carbon home? And I'm just going to finalise a little bit about why I think this is better for lives by sharing a little bit of an anecdote from me that I spent my 20s and early 30s renting very damp cottages in mid-Wales where I would just have one open fire in the living room. It's miserable. It really is miserable. Lovely in the summer, quite grim in the winter, and it's not good for family life either. So I think there's a real opportunity here to also improve lives and as well as giving consumers a lot more control over their energy. Thank you very much indeed, Rebecca. And that was good positivity, except for any Treasury civil servants watching who you just asked to give up their stamp duty revenue when they're already losing their fuel duty revenue uh, and they'll, they'll all give up their day's work by lunchtime. Just a suggestion, just, just being creative. Okay. I know, it's, you know, it's good to consider people's well-being of the viewers as well as of the uh, thing. Now, Adair, what's your level of perkiness? <laughs> uh, well, look, I, I think it's great that the Resolution Foundation is now bringing its classic skills of granular analysis focusing on households and distributional issues to this issue of how we uh, get the transition uh, to a zero carbon economy. And the starting point I was very good to see is that great uh, slide uh, taken from uh, chapter six of the Climate Change Committee's sixth carbon budget report, one of the great chapter sixes in the world. Um, and in there, there is that chart which shows the essence of the economics of this transition. Uh, a set of investments above the line and then a set of operational cost savings below the line. And what it shows is that there's an absolutely believable story that by 2050, uh, people in Britain on average will be better off than they uh, would otherwise be. They will be enjoying at least the same and possibly even a higher standard of living because of those operational cost savings. But that doesn't mean that it isn't costless it's or not difficult because you have to go through a period where there is investment. And investment, of course, doesn't mean GDP goes down. I mean, GDP will probably be as high as it would otherwise be. Indeed, you might argue that there's a set of multiplier reasons why it might even be higher. But if you've got to invest an extra 1.5% of GDP by the 2030s and you have the same GDP, that means less consumption. You've actually got to persuade people, let's make it come real here, spend a little bit less on restaurants and holidays and some more on heat pumps. That's, that's what this, this really means. So the issue is, is this possible? What policies uh, are to drive this? Where are we? And what are the distributional consequences? I would say the issues are important, but not you know, it, it, difficult to deal with in the transport space and really tricky uh, in the residential home space. So will the UK decarbonise road transport, passenger road transport? Yes, it will. Um, we now have a commitment that it will be illegal to sell a, uh, emissions producing cars uh, after 2030. That's in there. Uh, the manufacturers will have to respond. We will primarily respond to that by a rapid growth of uh, ele electric vehicle sales, which by 2030 will be getting to very high levels, and then that will run through uh, the stock. So will the transition occur? Do we have the instrument in place to make it occur? Uh, yes, we do. 
On the other hand, there are some distributional issues, and they are fundamentally of two things. One is the one that Johnny uh, highlighted, which is different access to cost of electricity. If you have off-street parking and you intelligently go to a company, I won't name what the market companies might be, and get yourself an electricity tariff um, so that you charge your uh, a electric car battery in the middle of the night, you will pay maybe 5p a kilowatt hour. And if you don't have off-street parking and you go to a charger in the street provided by a company providing that, you might be paying 30 or 40p a kilowatt hour. This is a, this is a big difference. So this issue of do you have access to off-street parking is going to make a lot of difference to the economics of buying an electric vehicle. Now, at least initially, electric vehicles are also going to be more expensive to buy up front, but much cheaper to run, provided you have access to that at-home electricity. And there is, therefore, a, a bit of a distributional issue because, essentially, richer people's cost of capital is much lower. Right? Somebody who has money already sitting in the bank uh, who can buy a car with cash has a close to zero cost of capital today. Somebody uh, who doesn't have that and has to buy it on a lease or a credit thing is paying a much higher cost of capital. So wherever we have upfront investment for future benefit, that has a clear distributional impact. I think that one of the things we ought to be doing now is really pivot the subsidy regime for electric vehicles to very strongly concentrate on cheaper cars. This also relates to the fact that the bias of the automotive companies is to produce electric versions of the bigger, more expensive cars, because that's where they make the margin. Our streets are filling up. Uh, with electric vehicles of SUVs. Dare hates SUVs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just, just put on record. He's, 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 he's like tiptoeing around it, but he really hates SUVs. <laughs> um, and we, you know, we don't need to subsidise those any uh, any longer. We've got a clear uh, forcing technique. We've got a uh, we've got a stick in there, um, but we need to make it easier for. The, we need to encourage the automotive engine uh, companies to be producing more smaller electric cars, and we should be subsidizing those uh, for lower income people, as well as providing charging infrastructure publicly and trying to make that as efficient and as cheap as possible. Now, we need to think about how to do that, but it may involve a more strategic plan of how we get there and some regulation, rather than allowing it to a completely chaotic market in which we end up with these somewhat expensive uh, a on street and a, a, a not at home a park it, a, a charging mechanism but the much bigger issue the bigger issue by far is residential uh, heat because just on the automotive i'm pretty confident that by the late 2020s electric vehicles will be cheaper to buy up front as well as cheaper to run so in a sense the technology is going to come to our rescue there but residential heat is the big one that's the big figure above the line on the chart uh, that Johnny uh, showed. And I actually think it's even bigger than the CCC thinks and the Treasury thinks. I mean, I actually think they've got, they've got too much above the line on EVs. I think they're overstating how much expensive EVs will be. But they're plugging in, I think it's about eight or 10,000 per household on the residential heat side. Wouldn't at all surprise me if it ends up being more. And so here, this is a invest now for what each household is a non-trivial amount of money for a future benefit which ought to be a future lower price though there's the issue that uh, becky has mentioned about the, uh, the 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 unequal treatment of electricity and gas today but these are significant elements of a uh, investment and they're also distributionally complicated because it's partly a gradient by income and wealth but it also has layers of granular detail, right? There are at least some people in less well-off homes who are already inefficient homes, right? And there are some people who are in very inefficient homes. Uh, you also have very complicated gradients by family size or age, etc. On the whole, um, higher uh, energy expenditures on residential heating correlate with income, but they don't entirely. 
Some of the highest is retired couples living at home and being at home all the time. I mean, rich people who leave their house to go to an office, which we may start doing again in future to a greater extent over last year, don't need to leave their heating on when they're not there. Retired people at home do. So we have a very, very granular uh, and complex distributional issue. And we will need a vision to how to uh, get through there. And this is the area where there isn't the government policy. It may be imperfect and incomplete, but on the EV transition side, we have a clear government policy. On residential heat, we don't really have a policy either to drive the transition at the speed that we want or to deal with the distributional consequences of that transition. I think it is going to have to be, again, a mix of sticks and carrots. At the upper end of the distribution, it should be things like higher council taxes or higher stamp duty. Uh, I've just made myself... I we were abolishing No, I've just, myself, I've just you myself... You need to make your minds up. No, no, I've just myself made myself popular with the Treasury because <laughs> Becky's reduction in some area is going to be offset my, okay. my increase. Yes, but absolutely. we need to use fiscal sticks or regulatory sticks to drive the people who have the income and wealth to make those investments uh, uh, take it forward. But we've also got to realise that these are significant investments for many lower income people who have higher cost of capital and we will have to have I think fiscal mechanisms uh, certainly mechanisms to enable people to borrow money uh, for these investments at very low rates uh, or and or uh, forms of direct distributional support so within everything that we're talking about here the big difficult one both in terms of driving the transition and in terms of the distributional implications of driving the transition is the residential heat side and that is where we need the government soon to end up with a strategy because each yes. year that we don't have a strategy uh, is making it more and more difficult to set the stretching targets which the climate change committee uh, recommended and which the government has accepted. Great thank you very much indeed Adair. The, um, that was uh, lots of food for thought and I think that chimes with exactly the argument we're trying to we're making in today's report. I mean, we agree entirely that heat, home heating is where the politics of net zero and the policy of net zero is going to come to live for the next 10 years, at least 15 years, the, um, and is the new part, but not least because of the point Becky makes about there being no, uh, there being nobody that can actually fit any heat pumps in most of the country. I Absolutely. Know, yep. I was having a conversation yeah. with some people up in um, yep. Sheffield Council. You'll have noticed they've just negotiated. They've just got a Green Labour coalition getting going yep. at Sheffield Council. And I think the, the Greens who've just entered the council reasonably said, you know, can we get on with putting loads of heat pumps into our council housing? And they said, and the, reasonably, the council officers said, uh, here is Jim. He's the one person <laughs> who knows how to fit heat pumps. Yeah, and if I could just make, make the point here, I mean, extra investment in a part of the economy, in particular in things that we do in the buildings, uh, is um, uh, extra labor. I mean, Marx was right. Capital is ultimately uh, uh, labor. Very early in the morning for that. Uh, a, and a, uh, a, again, the ETC, uh, sorry, the, the, the Climate Change Committee has given us a very good quantification of that, that by the early 2030s, we need order of magnitude 200,000 more people working on things to do with making the building stock more efficient, better insulated, putting in heat pumps. But that is, at one level, a great story in terms of leveling up, because those 200,000 jobs, unlike, say, jobs in the offshore a, a wind industry or the battery industry, which will be good jobs, but they will be necessarily focused on industrial clusters. By definition, these jobs to improve the building stock are jobs equally spread across the country in relation to the population and wherever there are buildings. So it ought to be one of the most attractive possibilities in levelling up to create 200,000 of these you know, uh, uh, insulators, plumbers, electrician type jobs. But we absolutely need 
a strategy for the development of those skills, which brings together the suppliers. Well, hold, hold on a minute. So we've got, we've got some great audience time. questions along the okay. way. So right. stop skipping, because you've got to give, yep. the, give the people a chance to ask their question before you answer it. Right. Okay. So, right. But first of all, just so for those of you um, watching on Slido, we're putting up the first poll, yep. uh, which is basically getting at this big question we've been asking, which is which of these areas will be the biggest challenge when it comes to, and hopefully you won't all just agree with us. So is it housing? which is basically getting this gas boilers out. Uh, is it transport? We focused in this discussion so far on household level transport, so private cars. There's obviously some other issues to do with um, decarbonising public transport and even harder decarbonising our air transport, which is obviously the, the big longer term challenge. Or actually, is it the bit we haven't discussed much until a day I went and cheated and skipped yeah. ahead, which is the world of work, which is some people work in carbon intensive industries yep. and those industries will need to either change a lot or shrink. Yep. The, um, uh, and is that, and I'd, I'd say, you know, if you see most of the just transition discussions over the last 10 years, actually they've tended to focus on this world of work question rather than the consumption question, which our discussion is focused on much this morning. So have a vote on that. Those of you on slide, I'm going to come back to the results in a second. And then let's dig into this. So I, th I thought we'd split this conversation. We've got about 40 minutes. So into two big chunks, there's change. So there's like the level of change, our readiness for change, how intrusive it is in our lives or our work. And then there's this costs question, which most of our conversations focus on, but like who bears which costs and actually who gets which benefits from this and, and how much can policy affect that versus how much is that intrinsic to the nature of decarbonisation. So I thought we'd do that. So let's start by taking, um, let's start by taking this general question of readiness. So the premise of this discussion is the government has set some ambitious targets. Those are ramping up during the 2020s. They require... As Johnny said in his presentation, they require decarbonisation to go from being something that happens in ab the abstract in the energy gen electricity generation business and to start happening in our lives, basically. That's the big change in what's going on. The, um, if you look at the opinion polling, the good news is the public thinks uh, climate change is a real problem and we should probably do something about it and supports government announcing targets, which is why governments keep announcing more ambitious targets every few years. And if you ask them what should change in their lives and are they doing enough, they broadly say, I'm doing quite a lot and I think other people should probably do something in their lives. Where, and they definitely don't say, I'm ready to replace my gas boiler, uh, uh, e and even if that costs me a bit of money in the near future. They're a bit, they're very, they are more positive about cars. So I think public readiness on cars is basically there. Yeah. But on other stuff to their lifestyles, there is not uh, a re readiness for really swift action on the scale we we need. So how do we like? How should we balance that optimism versus like general optimism versus specific lack of optimism? What do you reckon, Adair? Because you're always so perky. But let's have a bit. Of well, that. look, I think the answer is the. You've almost said it. That the most difficult things are where people have to do things in their own homes. So. It's important to realise, Johnny showed that figure that we'd, we'd brought down the emissions a lot in the electricity system. Um, there's still a lot to do in the electricity system, but it's now about making the electricity system much bigger while completing the decarbonisation. In fact, broadly, broadly speaking, over the last 10 years, we've taken a system delivering about 330 terawatt hours of electricity with a carbon intensity of about 550 grams per kilowatt hour. And we have now got a system actually producing no, much more, no more electricity than 10 years ago. The electricity demand has been flat because of efficiency, and it's down at about 200 grams per kilowatt hour. What we've got to do by 2035 is produce a system which produces almost twice as much electricity. It's getting on for five or 600 terawatt hours of electricity, and we've got to complete the decarbonization down to almost no grams per kilowatt hour. I, however, am relatively confident that this bit will happen. It doesn't require things that individuals have to do. It requires the government to come forward with a set of auctions for the, uh, what's going to happen, particularly uh, in the North Sea, which is our huge offshore wind resource. It needs clear vision. 
It needs stuff on the transmission and distribution system. It needs to enable National Grid to build, for instance, an efficient undersea network out in the North Sea rather than doing each wind farm and bringing it uh, to, to land individually with all the opposition that produces. There's a hell of a lot of stuff to happen, but for the vast majority of households, it's, it's happening somewhere in the economy. Um, they will see it if we get it right in they'll be using more electricity at no higher a price i'm moderately you know sure that will happen but i think and i'm reasonably sure that something that most of what will happen will happen on the electrification of uh, road transport i think we will drive that forward and it is as we said it's the building space in terms of, is it going to happen? Do you think the public opinion will move on that, or do you think it's just going to be a well, I think, I think nightmare? Public, I think public opinion just has not been told. Told. I mean, you know... Well, come on then, we, tell we, the public. We, we, yes, but this is not the public. What? The greatest what? respect. I mean, I mean, I love... Are you saying it I might be sample people, bias? I love the, uh, the, the, the people the who have come to resolution Good. Uh, webinars. They're very, very high-quality people, but to call them, you know, <laughs> the average public. Look, I think... One of the things that we need is for politicians to step up to explain to people what is required. I think probably, I find that m most people, you know, because they know I, I work in this stuff, this is what I do, they ask me, well, what do I need to do? Yeah. And when I start saying, you know, well, you've got to have a system which is not your gas boiler, they say, well, oh, is gas a problem? I mean, literally, yeah. the level of understanding of this transition is very, very low. Okay, let's so you, you need first people to understand just well. where the big emissions from their lifestyle are coming and that one of the biggest is their own residential heat. Rebecca, so go I was going to say that. I think it's about people's understanding and literacy levels on all of this. Now, if you look at dietary change, people are aware yep, yep. that eating meat to excess certain types of meat is not necessarily good for the planet. And we are seeing yep. veganism come with vegetarianism. So yep. what can we do yep. for, we're also seeing flight shaming as well. So yep. that's, that's another yep. emitting that's area another which, which people are aware of. So what can we do to make decarbonizing our, our heating sort of sexy? You know, I'm not entirely sure I've got the answer. I think perhaps roll out at a larger scale, maybe yep. across social housing, yep. would be a start. Yep. So friends who have got this, who've bought new houses, I've gone and seen it, and I've gone, wow, that's just an amazing bit of kit. You know, so we need to get more of that out there. It's never going to be as easy as, as dietary change, but I would say five years ago, I was very scared about talking about dietary change in public and, and thinking this is massively contentious. People are going to say, don't you tell me what to do. And actually, we're really seeing some movement on that front. So okay, that's good optimism again. The, um, let's bring up the results of the poll to see what everyone else uh, thinks back home. And then we're going to come on. Um, I've got a quick question for you, Rebecca, from the audience. So let's bring up the results on the screen, if we can. Here you go. Oh, well, that's really boring. Okay, fine. All right, you all agree with us. <laughs> this is the problem, okay, people? Even if you agree, let's at least pretend, because otherwise you haven't got a debate going. You, you should have done that before we presented. Oh, okay. yes. well, thank, you for the, thank you for the feedback. <laughs> the, uh, uh, we'll take that into account. You could, there's, a, there's a survey at the end. Everyone else can give us their feedback. Uh, right, now, Rebecca, a question for you here, which is on the specifics of some of this, which is we're talking about disruption via heat pumps being put in, but obviously heat pumps are only appropriate for some kinds of housing the, um, and a harder, hard, not impossible, but harder in flats, for example, or places with small gardens. So how should we, here's the question from uh, Henning. So what are the, like, how do you, how, is it, do the, uh, do the alternatives, are they less disruptive, more disruptive? How optimistic are you when you come to kind of, you know, some of your customers who are going to be wrestling with this in the decade ahead that we are, um, <coughs> that we're not going to get people scared off by basically being forced into one technology? I think, in terms of scale, there are enough residential houses where this clearly, heat pumps clearly are the answer. I wouldn't say they are the only answer. Um, they are quite large. I think they're coming down in size, so I think that outdoor space becomes less of an issue. I was surprised at how big some they're really big. are and quite noisy. But then some of them are also not. So I do have a lot of faith. We're really, really early on here in this technology journey. Yeah. And I think we will see massive, massive improvements. Yeah. I also wouldn't say heat pumps are the only answer. To me, they are the most scalable and, and the answer to, to the really material um, solution. Um, I think we will see some hydrogen, particularly in a sort of more of a mosaic pattern across the UK, particularly where you might have an industrial cluster that's producing hydrogen. So I wouldn't draw that out. I also um, wonder where we might be going with more conventional electric yeah. heating in homes 
and improvements to those sort of conventional storage heaters. So I think there are, there are different options, but let's tackle the one that we think is probably going to answer most of our housing stock, which is heat pumps, and let's just get on with that. Okay, very good. Now, um, Johnny, let's t- so as I said, before everyone went and voted and said they were all worried about heating rather than about um, uh, homes, as I say, the debate over the last decade actually you saw this a bit down at low party conference in brighton that you saw elements of this which is a lot of the debate was actually on climate optimists and climate campaigners saying let's get on with it and actually unions and workers saying hold on a second you're going to kill the steel industry uh, or, or if you're in germany the coal industry or in poland for that matter um and that it was a work it was a jobs concern that was the main thing so the question from uh stefan from the oecd which i think we can bring up on the again if i make the it work here you go the um so first of all he says it's an interesting topic that's encouraging stefan thank you uh here we go he's curious about whether the panel also see a role for labor market policy skills and working practice to push for a net zero economy rather than just getting just dealing with the problems that happen to the industries now adair's given us part of the answer here which is some people are going to work in the middle paying yep. sectors that deliver this home transition but what's the broader labor market side of this i mean there's a lot of jobs which um the only future is is low carbon so steel like you mentioned um across the europe and across europe and across the world countries and companies are investing in low carbon steel whereas in the uk we are not and this means that people employed in steel in the uk have got a, a time limiting factor on their employment unless we Get, keep um, make up pace with what's going on in the rest of the world because this is going to be the way that steel is produced in the future. It's more expensive now, but as the cost of making hydrogen comes down, it'll undercut the cost of making steel in an, in an emissive way. So we need to, as well, we need to sort of make sure the in, the industries and the and the the source of employment are for, forward-looking enough so that um, change of employment aren't sort of forced upon people as industries reach the end of their sort of life uh, at the end of their their lifespan. Also make sure that these are these are planned for and that you know training is offered for new roles for changes within the sector and changes outside of sectors as well. I think this point about um, this point about like, the nature of your economic strategy for a country like a liberal market economy like the UK is actually different in the an era of net zero than it is without one. Because the level of direction required, so this the steel is a really good example, where you basically got to transition to a bigger role for hydrogen in making your steel. Countries are, with, with steel industries are either going to decide to get on with that quickly, which is expensive, like, and it requires some public subsidies, that what we're seeing around the world, or they're going to say goodbye to their steel industry. And that is not going to be delivered by the market in general, you, if you want to keep your steel industry. And that is, that is a big change to how we've generally thought about uh, where, where how comparative advantage is decided between um, uh, different um, bit different sectors. The, um, is that fair well, in all direction? It, how commie have you gone? I mean, the, the, there's, there's the, the, there is the international competitiveness whether yeah. one country moves faster than another. But you, you've got to begin by saying, you know, at, at the whole economy level or at a closed economy level, where does this transition lose jobs and where does it gain jobs? And broadly speaking, it doesn't lose jobs in steel, right? I mean, there are some things at the margin, but steel mills that, you know, run with hydrogen as the direct reduction agent are not fundamentally different in the employment level than steel mills that uh, use coking coal as the reduction agent. I mean, I believe they're somewhat less, but we're not dealing with the transformational stuff, right? We are going to continue to produce steel. Big changes are going to happen in the global steel industry. It's going to move much more to recycled steel as we get to a sort of stock of steel that we need. But broadly speaking, if you look at steel, at cement, at chemicals, they're all things where we've got to change what we do and do it in a zero carbon fashion, but there isn't a fundamental change in the number of people employed in that industry. Where are the big numbers? And again, I would say the CCC has given us the big numbers. The automotive industry, in the future, it will take time, will employ less people than it does today, because electric engines are much, much, much simpler things to make. An internal combustion engine is unbelievably complicated. I mean, if we already had electric vehicles and somebody came along for the first time and described an internal combustion engine and said, what I'm going to do is put some high explosive into everybody's car and set off a set of controlled explosions, which is going to produce some motion, but also some heat. So I'm going to have to cool it down. And then I'm going to have to, you say, complete lunatic. 
Now, the automotive companies have done a tremendous job over 100 years in making this fundamentally complex thing work as best possible, but it's an immensely complicated supply chain with huge numbers of moving parts. Electric engines are massively simpler, and that means that by 2025, 2040, there are going to be less people employed in automotive manufacturing than today. And in repairs. And maintenance and as in well. Repairs and maintenance. I think repairs and maintenance. This is the even bigger one. Electric engines don't break down. They don't break down to anything like the same extent. So, broadly speaking, 100, 200,000 people will probably have to move from mending your internal combustion engine car when it breaks down to mending your house. Mending your house. I mean, this is where the big numbers are in switches and people. There is a separate issue, which is about comparative advantage. And there's a point I, you've made to me, Torsten, in the past is, it isn't all about jobs, it's also about value added. And even where there are relatively small numbers of jobs in absolute numbers, they're still important to the economic prosperity of a nation. So we have got to think about, you know, are we just going to buy our wind turbines from elsewhere, or are we going to have those supply chains of you know, high-quality jobs producing those wind turbines or the, the nacelles, the, uh, the, the engineering that goes into the running of it, uh, here in the UK? And so that is important, even if in total number of terms, it's not where employment, it's not where the big battalions are, either on the plus or the negative side. Right. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And just as an aside, I think this... I think it's really important when people think about countries' economic strategies that we basically countries go through phases of either just caring about their GVA, so like where's the value added coming from, which is the long-term driver of their living standards, or they go through phases of just caring about uh, employment. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't have both, you are stuffed, is yeah. our like, uh, polite way of putting it. And you've got to have a strategy that mainstreams both. The, um, they don't need to be the same thing. They can come from different sources, and one is not more important than the other, but you have to have both, otherwise you're basically either poor or you don't have enough jobs, and both are suboptimal. My right, last question in this section is from Claire, which is specifically on, there's actually a number of questions in this space, but we'll use Claire's one, which are basically to do with, okay, but how are we going to get people the skills to make this transition happen? Like, it's easy to say people are going to move from yeah. uh, fitting, uh, dealing with our mini explosion-based cars uh, to putting heat pumps into our homes. But so people are asking, what, how do we actually make that happen? Some of the people lower down are also asking us, um, can't we just get the existing gas boiler people to do all the heat pumps? The, um, so come on, why is, what do we need to do to make this actually happen in practice in the real world? I think we need a, a massive sort of training programme and, and awareness raising programme. We are coming out with a report which has got some of these suggestions in it in a few weeks, which I don't want to preempt really. Um, but, but certainly embedding this into, into training and education much more, which is a bit of a no-brainer. I think these 130,000 gas engineers could probably be retrained to be heating engineers. That, that also seems like a little bit of a no-brainer. We aren't going to be having gas. Do need heat. Yeah. Um, so I, I, again, do feel quite optimistic about the ability to do this. We have done these things in the past. We have had these transitions and we have changed things. We definitely have. That is true. Just, I mean, this is an example on, so this goes on, on this like liberal versus directive yeah. nature of going the day you're gone. Yeah. Well, well, in part, the market will do it if it knows where we're heading, right? I mean, if you were a small business with, you know, one heat pump, you know, engineer on your role and, and then you're the self-employed manager of it and you were thinking, should I go out and have an apprenticeship program? Should I plan to have five of them in my business in five years' time? You might do that if there was a clear government strategy with a set of subsidies, etc., which made it reasonable to expect that there's going to be demand there. But if you don't know that the demand is there, you, know, you won't do it. So part of this is just a very, very clear plan on what forms of subsidies are we going to produce? When are we going to take the existing gas boilers out? And then the market will pull through. Now, it won't pull through entirely because there is then a role of government support for training and, and you know, local making sure that, you know, the, the places are available for training, etc. But I think step one is to give the market the best opportunity to work by giving certainty because if you were you know, an SME potentially in this business at the moment, you wouldn't go out and preemptively hire some new people because there is no 
there is no plan, there is no certainty that yeah. the demand will be there. So okay. creating the certainty of demand, I think, is the most important step one. You are, see, because at your heart, although you keep referencing Marx, you are basically a massive liberal stool, I dare you see. And the, uh, are we, no, 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 well, just I'm, to sound a bit less, more directive on it, so government has obviously <laughs> tried, government has obviously tried lots of ways. I mean, you know, government's banging on about how they were definitely going to support homes to become uh, more energy efficient is like one of the big stories of the, and basically every policy we've tried in this area has been yeah. a turkey so even in the last 18 months the government has announced a big retrofit program it's, and the reason it's failed in, there's other reasons which is the public doesn't want to take on loans basically yeah. to retrofit their houses one reason so that's like that's like a psychology problem but you've also got a delivery problem which is we keep put, trying to push money and uh, policy into an industry that has basically is under-regulated um, is poor quality, and basically people are then going around being ripped off by people who don't turn up to put. No, no, you may well need. You need some regulation. You, you need some regulation. You need to define standards. You need yeah. to help make sure you that trust you. people know where they can go, and that is a certified heat pump engineer who's going to do it in a good job. So um, that doesn't quite make one a Marxist, though, at Torsten, I think. I didn't say I was a Marxist, though. I was a little bit less liberal than you. No, no. I think the Greenham grant failed because it was a bad policy rather yeah. than a lack yeah. of demand. Yeah. There, was, there was a huge uptake for it, a huge interest in it. And yeah. the way the policy was designed not only had implications last year when there was a mess and it's it was embarrassing pandemic. for the government, but also for communicating to the public that millions of homes need upgrading, millions of heat pumps need installing. If the only interaction with that process so far is with a, a fairly shoddy scheme, that's not going to help with future iterations. Yeah, well, it's all a bit of insulation, which is slightly different, I think, from, Easier, from, heat, yeah. from heat pumps. I mean, it's a very local issue, yeah. very much. And there is, there is an obligation on electricity suppliers to, to do insulation schemes and energy efficiency schemes. And I think that's actually working quite well because they're used to people are used to having someone coming in and reading their meter they're used to that sort of interaction we also know where these people live we know who they are so i think that that's been quite positive okay that's I mean, good there are cool. other levers of the uh, areas of the housing stock or the building stock which naturally give themselves to government initiative you know regulation in the social housing stock yes, or yes. support for that yeah. or you know insulating the office buildings of hospitals and schools etc and there now it may cost money it may mean that you've got to move away from the lowest cost expenditure on those buildings but that is where you can use the power of public procurement to help create some of these skills and capabilities which are then available for the private um, owned owner occupation stock i think that's what we need to get heat pumps off the ground very much but i think also for a homeowner there has to be value in having a green home, and that was sort of what I was alluding to in my somewhat flippant stamp duty comment. Um, but there's certainly a role for green mortgages, and we are yep. seeing that come. We really are, and I think in the yep. next year that's going to be quite. We're going to see a real escalation in that. Space. Okay, well, let's because the green mortgages and others are, tr uh, are basically attempts to answer the cost, both the yep. timing and the distribution of the cost problem. Yep. Yeah, and they help on the timing, and they're less helpful on the distribution, basically. On well, but on the distribution, I mean, if you think about, I, I sometimes think about it. You know, there are there's a sort of income elite who are also a wealth elite who who have, you know, if it's fifteen thousand quid, they've probably got fifteen thousand quid in the bank, and they should get on with it, earning zero. Their cost of capital is zero. They should get on with it. Um, and they should be forced to get on with it. There are other people at the other end who actually need, you know, support uh, to to do it. Um, you know, distributional support from uh, fiscal transfers. There is probably a non-trivial slice in the middle, who, if they have an existing mortgage, which is now at sixty percent loan to current value, and if their mortgage provider says, "Look, here is a dead simple way of adding ten to fifteen percent." To your mortgage and maybe you put in a bit of a fiscal sweetener to make sure that that yeah, incremental yeah. interest rate is as low as possible so here's another fifteen thousand quid it's going to cost you one percent to borrow this yeah. um you know if we made that very very smooth that i think might be relevant for the sort of intermediate between you know the upper income upper wealth groups who have the money to just get on with it immediately and the bottom third of or whatever it is of the population who will need support to do it that is yes. so i think that so that is exactly the policy discussion that basically we actually need to have yeah. and if i'm honest i think I, I, I mean, maybe i'm too pessimistic on this but I, it's not actually clear to me the government is ready to have that conversation because it, it does require telling people very clearly the boiler's coming out basically and that is 
uh, difficult and it requires transparency because you wouldn't if the cost wasn't 10k yep. then you wouldn't need these complicated yep. policy mechanisms to deal with it so as soon as you have the mechanism you've got to tell people the cost is actually quite high and that is where the rubber hits the road on yep. the part and it would just be easier to wait for but I think most of you on the panel are more optimistic than me Johnny what's your so in your presentation you're highlighting two chapters so the campaigners in this area all point to the back end of the period of your chart showing look how cheap everything is by 2050 the uh, the climate denialists who have now become have now like transitioned out of denial and are now just in the like yeah. tell everyone it's expensive and like just make a load of mess and make it hope it goes away kind of yeah. thing is the, that's the modern denialism those are the two kind of not particularly helpful positions that are taken you you're highlighting the slightly more realistic um, position which is it's doable but there are big timing problems and there's big distributional problems so. Adair's given us his example of how you might deal with that in some of the heat pump area, sorry, in the en home energy area more broadly, actually, and, and retrofitting. But, the, um, but why isn't it happening if it's so easy? If Adair can fit it into one sentence, why is none of that happening? Um, and is there, and well, tell us a bit about what the government might be announcing before COP. So I guess the main reason it's not happening is because it costs money. Um, the government is going to have to pay for some of this, and yep. cash is tight at the moment. Um, and I guess there's other, other priorities at the moment. But, you know, before COP, did we know we're expecting the heat and building strategy, which needs to deliver a route to a f decarbonized housing stock. If it doesn't do that, it's not good enough. Um, and that was going to have to include both a focus on able to pay households, people with 15 grand sat in the bank, but also those who are going to need support to do it. And also, crucially, landlords, the private rented sector is some of the worst houses in the country, some of the leakiest houses, some of the some you know, many that fall decent of fall fall foul of the warm of these, these decent home standards, and the both the sticks and the carrots that landlords face at the moment to make their homes better aren't sufficient. They've been they've been lobbied down. They're largely ignored, and this is a huge amount of the building stock which could be upgraded, which could be removed from the gas network, um, which could be nicer to live in, cheaper to run, um, and again are often populated by people at the bottom of the income spectrum. Uh, his, his, this is a question for you, for uh, Adair and for Rebecca. So, um, so the irony is we basically need lots of public investment to deliver uh, the transition for low-income households, basically, for these, for these heating systems. Yeah? That's the big picture where policy needs to get to eventually. The irony is the government is actually heading, has put big increases in public investment into the public finance numbers. We will be at the highest level of sustained investment since the 70s when we nationalised it. Everything was nationalised, yeah? So we were spending a lot of investment running those industries. Now we're going to have a lot of it. The irony is that actually, because people don't want to talk about this problem yet, the money's not being spent on yep. heating systems. If you're, if you're Boris Johnson, and this is not, it's true of both main parties. So Boris Johnson, he's putting in lots of public investment, higher since the 70s, but wants to spend it on science. Yep. Uh, and he wants to spend it on levelling up centre of towns, and he wants to spend it on transport and a bit of housing. Okay, but There's lots of it happening. It is not being earmarked for dealing with this challenge yet. And the Labour Party this week has called for £28 billion a year. It's not absolutely clear how much of that is on top of what the government's doing and versus uh, including what the government's doing, but it's a lot of money. Okay, It's probably you know per capita and for the size of the economy bigger than what's happening in the States under Biden's plans if they ever actually pass the Senate. The, um, there's a lot of money, but if you hear them talking about what that money is to be used for, it's very much in the industrial space. Yeah. It's in the science, it's in the industrial space. Down the list you get some, the homes get mentioned, but it's not the thing. So are we sure that politics wants to focus on the like green job shiny bits of this transition and not on the actually hard bit? Well, I mean, my point is that actually in terms of levelling up and green jobs, this ought to be one of the most well, attractive. Why they, I know, but why are they not agreeing with Well, you? the answer is I, I find it surprising. I mean, <laughs> for the last couple of budgets, I have been expecting something big on the housing stock because actually I think, you know, there's an alignment here of what we need to do uh, for uh, the climate um, and the levelling up and the jobs agenda, I think, is one of the clearest bits of the levelling up and jobs agenda. I mean, I, I'm passionately in favour of spending more money on the science base. However hard you try, the science expenditure will be focused 
on particular existing clusters of excellence. And if you think that's not going to occur, you're deluding yourself because you will get the highest bang for the buck on science by reinforcing where you have excellence already. So if you think you're going to spread jobs across the country by spending money on the science budget, I do think that's a delusion. This is the housing stock is where there's a real opportunity to contribute to the leveling up agenda. So I don't know, Torsten, why there's a tendency. <laughs> It's not as shiny, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it's, it's not shiny. You've got to tell people there's a big bill. It, it, a, there's a big bill. You're not going to pay B, for all of it's, it. It's, it's, it's 20 million individual 10,000 pound projects. Yeah. It's not a great big shiny new factory or bridge or science lab. And there's a sort of we tendency like to, to go for grand projet, which are attractive. There is. I think in the investment, though, the other thing I would say is it's very important to realize where we need the public balance sheet and where we probably don't. So there are huge investments, big investments, to make that bigger electricity uh, system. You know, we've got to take offshore wind in the North Sea from, what have we got now, probably about 15 gigawatts running, I think, up to 40 by 2030, maybe 100 uh, by, by 2050. But if you get the market structure right, that will be funded by private investors because if you get a market structure right which through the use of contracts for difference creates a, a certainty of future revenues flow you have created a classic infrastructure finance low risk low return and the world is full of money private money which wants a yield uplift against rock bottom uh, treasury uh, a, a bond rates guilt rates um, that money's there you don't need to deploy I don't think on a large scale, the public balance sheet in that area. Where you need the public balance sheet, I think, is to deal, or, or just the public transfer, because yep. there's an issue of whether you do keep this as capital investment or is it just, you know, it, it's capital investment at the micro level. Yep. Uh, in treasury terms, it might be just straight current investment transfer. Um, it, it, this is where you need fiscal power to make progress and I, I think we've just got to keep uh, through the Resolution Foundation and everybody else making that argument again and again that this is the big missing bit of UK climate right. policy let's, so let's, far. I want to get some questions from the audience in so yeah. let's bring up one here which is uh, but Rebecca why you take this because you, read, you mentioned this slightly which is a lot of what we're discussing here in terms of um, yeah. uh, providing this fiscal support happens at a national level yeah. realistically yeah. lots of the rest of this needs doing at a local level. Yeah. Yeah, I'm particularly housing is very much a local level. I mean, that just comes back to our, the social housing comment that we yeah. made before, with local authorities really taking responsibility. We're seeing lots of individual councils set uh, a climate emergency. I'm still not entirely sure what we mean by a climate emergency, what that drives, but, you know, that's something. Yeah. We're also seeing the recruitment of, of sort of climate change officers in different, in, in, in different councils. What are they doing? I think. Uh, not entirely clear, but I think we're, we're, getting, we're getting... Any of you that are out there it, that are climate you know, change officers, email us. We want to know what you're doing do day to day. To not in a stalking kind of way, but in a informing <laughs> us kind of way. But I have seen quite a lot of these, these doors being okay. advertised, so that gives, Great. Me, that gives me some confidence. I'm just going to go back a little bit to how can we get the government to look at heat, actually. Yep. And now I possibly have a slightly misplaced confidence in the role of the... Um, climate change committees yep. and your progress reports yep. but they do focus yep. the government you, know, you yep. have to debate those in parliament yep. and if you look back to where we were with transport that was quite a few a few years ago that was a, just a line and it was actually going up yep. on the grass yep. and it was sort of how are we ever going to get that to turn around and that's actually happened relatively quickly mm. so again this is the optimist in me speaking I think the time will come when the focus will suddenly be on that awful line on those charts for housing and the need to act Okay, that's good. A good bit of optimism. Now, I want, we focused here on the costs. So let's just perk ourselves up a bit and focus on the benefits for a second, the, um, which is there are significant. There's like the saving the planet benefit, which has quite broad, it's quite a large, quite broad benefit. So we're all in favour of that, I'm assuming, yeah. the, um, which is why we're taking the whole net zero thing as a given, as an objective. But there are other benefits in terms of, you know, cleaner air, um, other things. Some, there are actually some financial benefits. And, and I think... Johnny, one of the things we're trying to add with this discussion paper today is that it's not just the distribution of the costs that matters to how this whole thing plays out over the next 30 years. There's actually big differences in the distribution of the, the benefits too. Yeah, huge distribution. Um, to, go, to, go, to go on cars, if you, live in a, you know, if you live on a main road at the moment, you're going to see a huge improvement in your local air quality yeah. as cars, yeah. as transport decarbonises. And this has, this has effects on, on your way of life, on house prices, yeah. on, yeah. On, you know, on health of yourself and of your family. 
Um, and again, warmer homes as we decarbonise housing, you know, there's this, the state of Britain's housing stock is is close to being an embarrassment compared to those those in Europe. And speak to yourself. My house is perfectly fine. Well, <laughs> um, mine isn't. No. Um, but uh, but yeah, improving that means that we're going to not only like spend less money on on gas, which you know, is expensive, is imported. And we're also going to have you know less damp, less mould, better living conditions. It's better for sleeping, better for learning, better for working from home. It's just yep. a, a vast improvement in, in the quality of life, which is beyond just lower lower costs of, of driving around. But I don't want to sound like a kind of, you know, the money, the accountant here. But what about the money? Like, so we mentioned, we met, like, if you, look, if you look at that saving, if you look at the, the money that's things that's saving you money in the long term, it basically is just cars. It is cars. It's all cars. The rest of it's like tiny. Yeah, but this 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 assume this is taking the CCC cost forecast as a given, which you know historically underestimated how much energy gets cheaper. Yeah. And if um, if we move to electrified heating, more widespread, yeah. that is going to be that's only going to get cheaper, and it's only yeah. going to undercut. I, I think by the second half of the century, if we're successful, household budgets will be spending both less on road transport and less on heating than they were, would under a business as usual. I think you know it, it will take longer to get there on the residential heating side, but I think that's where we will be eventually. But there's a cost of the investment required to get there. And, and also we'll be dead today. But well, that's, that's, yeah, our personal, that's just our personal problem I rather than the... Uh, <laughs> the anyway, <laughs> right, let's... Uh, you won't be dead. I'm done, basically, <laughs> we'll be the, anyway, the, um, the way things are going. Uh, right, the, um, okay, so we've covered off timing issue. We've covered off the distribution. On the distribution, we need to focus on the cost, but also where the benefits lie. I want to briefly touch on some of the, the macroeconomics of this. Okay, so there's two issues coming through on the questions. Uh, one, um, which is from uh, Sushil X of the MPC, who reasonably oh. asks us, uh, reasonably asks us, and this is slightly related to, like, so how much of what is going on, okay, is that this whole net zero transition is us dressing up, basically, a supply shock to the economy, one we want to make happen, uh, and that's going to have implications for the overall level of inflation in the years ahead. The, um, and would it be better to have a higher inflation target? By the way, there's going to be lots of Resolution Foundation reports on a higher inflation target next year, although those are mainly not being driven by the net zero transition. They've been driven by the fact that we haven't got a macro policy framework anymore. But, the, um, but would that higher inflation target, which is this is basically, can we lubricate the economy with a higher level of inflation uh, so that we don't end up with relative price changes causing us big problems as we look to make this transition. So what do you think, Adair? You're the kind of the, the macro-ish guy on the panel. Well, uh, that's a new question for me. So thank you, Sushil, for Life is that. all about new questions, isn't it? Um, I, I start with the assumption, no. Um, uh, this is where I get a bit conventional. I think there's something to be said for once you've got an inflation target, having the certainty of broadly uh, sticking to it. Um, very important that inflation targets are not zero, but are positive it's precisely in order to uh, lubricate the movements in relative prices that all economies need to uh, adjust. Uh, I think I'd have to think about this more. I mean, do, obviously, we, we will have, you know, some significant shifts in, in relative prices. So you always have to remember... It, there are major transitions here, but there is about 90 or 95 percent of the economy not which is it. fundamentally not affected here, right? I mean, broadly speaking, if you run a law firm or an entertainment company or, you know, a, a, a local pub or, you know, a, a, you know, all sorts of different things. You've got to change a boiler, basically. The, 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 That's it. You know, what changes for you is a relatively small part of the business that you're running. So it's important that we mustn't overstate it. And, you know, at one level, this is a transition, but I think it's a less big transition than what post-war Europe went through in the shift from agriculture to industry. I mean, that's a high bar. Uh, but, but, but it's also the numbers that we're talking about here, right, of how many jobs have to shift from A to B, they're less than we took out of the coal industry in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. So, you know, economies are always going through structural change. We need to plan this. So I think my answer, Shushil, is no for now. Okay. But um, 
I'll think about it further and you may be able to convince me. Okay. So should I think, our, our, no, well, as in, we're, gonna, we're doing that research at the moment. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a, my starting point is actually is that you're probably right, so sure, but maybe less for the net zero reason and okay. yes, for lots of other reasons. Yeah. Although I should say, I think it's really hard. Yeah. And ideally, we'd like the Yanks to get on with it first because it would make it much easier well, look, for the rest of us to do step it. Step one, like, I mean, what I'd have said a year ago, it's all a bit more complicated now with this temporary shock that we got. Yeah. What I've said a year ago is, Central banks should make sure that we hit the inflation target that we've got. And a year ago, <laughs> that's the old problem. Well, a year ago, we were standing at the end of five years where the totality of central bank actions was not getting us up to the two yes. percent target. Yep. Now we are in this particular phase. My own belief is I'm still sticking to it with slightly less confidence than I was two months ago that this is going to be a temporary surge, yep. and that by two years' time the fundamental problem for central banks will still be how do we get the inflation rate up to the 2% target rather than down. Okay. But we'll see, we're clearly, in an ex uh, we're clearly in a set of supply shocks much bigger as we came out of COVID than I think almost any economist managed to predict. I mean, I think this is, this is a real uh, humility creator for the economist profession. I know very few people who knew that we were going to hit, hit these multiple forms of you know, labor and capacity is in the wrong place when you close down an economy and start it again. It's a bigger effect than we some of us, I'd say some of us, I think that is true on the scale. Yep. Some of us told the government back in July that okay. they should expect a much bumpier ride than they were planning for, and, yep. uh, and it has arrived. But, okay. the, um, you know, but, you know, but yes, I think humility in general about certainty on any of this stuff is yep. definitely a good idea because the world is a very uncertain place. Right, uh, we're making another poll live, which is about, um, so Johnny was talking earlier about what the Chancellor needs to do ahead of the spending review. So remember everyone, the spending review is in the last week of October. Any of you with the kids will remember this because it's half term. Why would the Treasury do that? No one knows. They're, anyway, but he needs to announce lots of net zero policies ahead of that. Are they going to deliver this because, are they, are they likely, or are you confident they're going to deliver getting us on track for the net zero targets? In a second, Johnny's going to tell us what we are currently and are not on track for because there's a million targets just to keep you all confused. The, um, uh, or are you not? I'd say the reason for optimism is uh, COPs happening like 10 days later and yeah. no one wants to be embarrassed about being off track. Uh, the reasons for uh, pessimism are the politics of this are quite complicated. Uh, the government can probably mm, say some warm words, get through COP, and then there's no pressure till the 2023-24 election. So we'll see you in the middle of the decade before we get going. So let's have your votes on that. 30 of you have already voted, so let's get the rest of them in. The, um, uh, Johnny, remind us what targets we are and we are not on track for. Uh, so we're on target for our carbon budget, which is we're in the middle of now, our third carbon budget. After that, we are not on track for anything. For anything. Okay, that was at least simple, Johnny. Right. Okay, so we should get on track. The, um, while you're all voting on that, then I want to just touch on this big picture, because a lot of what we're talking here on timing of costs and distribution of costs sits underneath this big macroeconomics issue, which is um, what does the net zero transition do to your macroeconomy? And lots of the rows from the kind of denialists and the kind of campaigners is it's either going to like drive much faster growth, or the campaigners say, GDP is going to surge because of the green transition, or it's going to kill growth if you're a denialist and the GDP is going to fall because it's a supply shock to the economy. Mm -hmm. um, actually, our view is both of those are overdone, and the big issue is we need investment to go up and we need consumption to come down. And the consumption can come down today if we pay for this stuff up front, or it can come down tomorrow if we pay for it through borrowing. But that is basically your two choices. Is that a, is that a fair big picture? Yeah, I mean, so what is the case for this being positive? I mean, if we were in America in 1932 and, you know, Roosevelt got elected, huge investments around a climate change agenda would be positive for growth because you had huge underemployed uh, capacity. Uh, you had, you know, ex-ante attempted savings higher than ex-ante attempted investment. The need to investment would close that gap. Um, you know, I mean, what actually pulled America out of that eventually was spending ahead of the war uh, and the war itself. You know, a climate war could be the same. So the question is, are we remotely in that environment? Do we have a whole load of spare capacity? I mean, broadly speaking, Keynesian multipliers uh, produce a higher level of growth than they otherwise would be if you start with large aggregate spare capacity. 
There was an argument, to which I have you know, some sympathy, which has been put forward by people like Larry Summers, the sort of secular stagnation hypothesis, that we live in a world in which there are some reasons, inequality, various forms of current account imbalances, where there is a sort of structural imbalance of ex-ante attempted savings and a, a desired private investment that that is why we have uh, real interest rates at very, very low equilibrium levels, and that in that environment, what's not to like about the need to mm -hmm. invest? I would attach some importance to that. I, I think there, there is some of that, but I don't think we, we, we're not remotely like a, a, a 32 type situation, a Great Depression. So I think there's at least some possibility that the need to invest on this might be mildly uh, beneficial for aggregate growth. But on the whole, I think this is about a need in uh, some countries for a switch in the composition of growth uh, from consumption to investment, matched by the fact that in the biggest and most important economy in the world, actually, what we need is a switch precisely the other way. Yeah. One of the biggest problems we have in climate change is China overinvestment in concrete. physical construction, which is driving enormous use of concrete and cement and steel to produce investment assets which will end up being completely wasted in second and third tier towns which are going to be in excess of China's needs as its population begins to decline. So at the global level yeah. we need more investment in some parts of the world. China, China, and we've argued this in China, if China just stopped spending 2% of GDP of the 25% that it is expending at the moment on physical construction I mean, it should cut that more, but it would just have to take 10% of it, quite a lot of which is wasted. It could absolutely afford the whole of the investment needed to drive decarbonisation far faster. So, net, net, Torsten, you know, I certainly don't think this is negative for economic growth. It might be mildly positive, um, but I think the biggest issues are the issues we've actually been talking about, which is how, what, how does government need to lubricate both the sectoral reallocations and the yep. distributional uh, challenges, and that that's where the big story is rather than a big macro story. That's my own belief. Great. The, um, and that's also a relief that we haven't wasted the last hour and a quarter. Um, so no further viewers time. Now, let's bring up the results of the poll, and then we're going to wrap up uh, the event. So what was your level of confidence? Oh, look, oh. you're a bunch of... Oh. See, look, see look, all I'm saying is, you three are all pretty confident. I'm afraid I'm with the punters on being less confident. Yep. The politics of this points to let's pretend these heat pumps don't cost £10,000 yep. and I'll see you in 2024. Yep. But, you know, I've been wrong on everything else in the last decade, so hopefully I'm wrong on that again. Look, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning and thank you to the panel for their uh, thoughts. As a leaving thought, I'm going to leave you one of all with one of the questions from uh, one of the audience, which is, why don't you all go and retrain as heat pump engineers? Off you go, everyone. Have a lovely day and see you all at a new event soon. <laughs>